Okay, see you guys later. There, of course, is my daughter, Jonna. <laughs> Growing up when I did, they did talk about stranger danger and saying that you don't interact with strangers, you know, to stay away from those kind of people that could harm you. But nobody ever told me that it could be going on in my own house, that it was someone that I knew and trusted. The reality is 87 to 92 percent of sexual assault occurs where the victim knows the perpetrator. I thought like somehow I was special, only I was the one that he was doing these things to. I realized I'm not alone. We know that one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before the age of 18. I think the biggest misconception that people have about me is that I have it all and everything is wonderful and perfect because I'm really, really good at making it look like that. With my father, whatever interactions we had and the inappropriateness, I just assumed that that was normal. Hey everybody, it's Mallory Hagen. We're here with Make It Count, where it's all about making your life count for something. And I am here with Jonna Janis, who has absolutely, without a doubt, made her life count for something. If you would, just give everybody a brief overview of, of your history and sort of what led to the, the desire to make this documentary, Invisible Scars. I started working on the documentary after I realized that my life had kind of been on Hold for a long time and I realized that after I met a woman who I admired for many many years and we used to do volunteer work together at hospice in Northern California so this was a woman who was vice president of a bank um, we raised almost two million dollars together to build a hospice house and it was during that time period that she and I became very close and one day she took me to lunch and she said John I've been watching you for years and I really feel like you have it um, achieved what I think you're capable of achieving and I feel like I know why and she said I want to tell you my life story so you can understand how I got to be where I am today so she began to tell me about her father and how he molested her and it was the first time I had ever heard anyone say that in my life and I broke down crying I really didn't know what to think about it except here was this woman who you know not only was someone that I admired but she was just giving me this raw story about her and and really being a human being well someone who had per in your eyes perceived perfection you looked up to her in a way that made you feel like how could you have ever experienced that and exactly yeah that's that's really that's something to, to see I think when if you see another person that you admire that's a mentor break down and, and tell you how they really got to be where they are, especially when it's with overcoming obstacles. So she began to tell me the importance of healing and how that completely altered her life. And she said, I wasn't able to go to therapy at first because I wasn't ready for that. So I read a book and she told me the name of the book. And she said, after that, I found the courage, I went to therapy, and then my life started to change. Mm -hmm. And she said, what I have today is a reflection of all that change. I had to create an environment with happy people, with healthy people, and that's what I have today. She said, I really want to encourage you to start your healing journey. So four years after that, I started on my journey. Um, I changed everything in my life. I decided to go back to school. I was a high school dropout, and that was sort of an after effect from my own abuse. And I just started life all over again. What was it that landed you? Because many people write a book, or they heal on their own, or they travel, sort of eat, pray, love style. What was it that landed you on a documentary? So originally I was writing a book about my life and that was kind of the way that I would deal with the flashback. So I'd have a flashback and I would write kind of in a journal. So I would write um, like a chapter and I would title it and then I would add to it over the years. Then I was in a car accident in 2010 and it was during that time period where my whole life stopped. And so everything that I knew, every coping mechanism that I had developed, which at that time was being an athlete, a triathlete, um, that stopped. And so I didn't have the ability to have control like that. And so I had to, again, start over. And through that, I had to deal with my past. I had to deal with the flashbacks. I had to deal with um, understanding that covering it up with something else is not a form of healing. And that's essentially what happened when I was an athlete. Right. I, I wanted to talk about that. You go in depth in your documentary about the accident and you see you in really vulnerable moments. And you, you start the documentary with your marriage to your last husband. Mm -hmm. and this triathlete, very strong, like you were saying, and, and using that as a tool to 
decompress or to remove yourself from anxious situations and really diving into athletics in a way that a lot of people find addiction in other areas when they are victims of abuse. And I was wondering as I watched, you didn't, you didn't fully say it, but wondering if in all those times that you were lying there bedridden because of your accident, if that, you know, you say you didn't have control over the situation, but you didn't have control over your mind either. Sort of when you're physically unable to do what you were doing athletic, as an athlete, uh, as an athlete, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you know, you're sort of forced to, to lie and think. Um, do you feel like that that was a huge turning point in your healing process and that, that having to, to be still? Definitely. I mean, I think my whole life I was always staying busy. I mean, mm -hmm. almost to the point where I was not dealing with my reality. So even if you ask my kids, they'll tell you she was always busy volunteering, doing this, doing that, PTSA, friends. I was always helping everybody else but not myself. So when the car accident happened, I had to focus on myself. I had to learn to have boundaries with my body. And really, I mean, I was beating up my body over the years so that I had an outlet. Right. And when the car accident happened, I did have to stop and I did have to assess everything in my life, my marriage, my friendships, my relationships with my children. Today, I understand more now how devastating that was even for them because it was, here was a super mom that they knew that could do everything. You know, I could juggle a hundred things at once and then I wasn't able to brush my teeth you know, or brush my hair or drive them in the car. And so everything that they knew went away as well. So it was really me re-identifying and then finding other things that were more like medicine as opposed to coping mechanisms. So the, the time frame of the documentary, I know over the course of five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so aside from your, uh, your car accident and that loss of the athlete that was there before, what were some other hurdles that you faced and why do you think, or what were the reasons why five years was the, the time frame that your documentary covers? Well, I self-funded, so I did one small fundraiser and that helped with the first round of editing, but you know, funding a documentary, it's not cheap. And right. so I had to do it in waves. And then also I was going back to school and so it's very time consuming. And I also had to work around the schedule with Sergio and so it was like, he might be working on another project with National Geographic or some other you know, project. Mm -hmm. And so he'd have to go off and do that. And he lived in another state. And so it was challenging in that regard. Also too, sometimes I would interview someone and I would think, this is the perfect match. And then when you're doing a documentary, you might interview someone else and say, wait a minute, That's I what... think this is good, but I have someone else that might complement what we already have in the content. And so that was part of it. It's a lot of piecing things together. Yeah, piecing things together and understanding what flows, what doesn't flow. And then it was really when I met with Dr. Vincent Felitti and the A study came mm -hmm. into the documentary and that's when it completely changed. And that's, I remember the day that we interviewed him and Sergio said, this film has now been taken to a completely different, different level because it opened it up to so many other people and their experiences not just sexual abuse, that's the huge topic that we want to talk about here, but it's that everybody has a story and everybody carries some kind of scar, sure. and that ACE study is very validating for people, and right. so, I mean, I learned a lot just right. from making my own film. So for those of you who don't know, the ACE study is Adverse Childhood Experiences, and it's a score, it's a 10-question quiz, essentially, that assesses the amount of childhood experiences that you have had that could lead to adult depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a myriad of other things. And Jonna, in the documentary, takes the ACE study live there, takes the 10 questions, and your score was a nine out of 10, right? So um, really being able to assess on camera what that means and how the things in your life have played out as a result of that ACE study, it was really fascinating to watch. And I'm sure that of all the ways that you were vulnerable, that's also a really vulnerable thing to do on camera. And so I think a lot of people will benefit from seeing how impactful that ACE study has been and, and can be for other people. I know that you just had the premiere in Los Angeles. So um, aside from what I can imagine was a very overwhelming experience for you, what was what was the best part of that, of, of seeing that all come together and having those people in the room? What really meant something to me was at the end of the film, when I was kind of talking with people, I had those people from the media come without their media hats on and thank me for inviting them to the premiere because the film touched them in some way. In fact, there was one woman who actually said to me, I'm a survivor and I wanted to come and report on this. I'm sorry, but um, that was that's very impactful to me mm -hmm. to see that because I want this film 
to show people that we're all human beings. And I think we've forgotten that. We hide behind our masks and we yeah. do our routine every day and we forget that we all have a lot more in common than we think. Well, so, like you said earlier, we all have a story. We do. I just want to touch on your kids a little bit because as a child of a mother who is a survivor of sexual abuse, I, I completely identify with how impactful your mother's experience can be on your childhood. So definitely. Um, do you feel like your children had closure from the experience of the documentary? Do you feel like when they watched it, they understood you more? What was their takeaway in, in your eyes? So I would say that, I mean, you know, there's a section in there where I talk about my eldest daughter being affected because she's really the one who had it the hardest. You know, I hadn't healed for most of her life. And so I think it's been challenging for her. So I know that there's a piece that's, that was very validating for her. We talked about it a little bit, but she's kind of the more guarded one of the three. My son came up to me afterwards and he said, Mom, you're actually a good filmmaker. That was really cool. So coming from my son, it was very cute. He's a little engineer kid. And then my youngest daughter, she had seen pieces of it, but never the whole thing. And so at the same time, she also said, Mom, I didn't realize all these things that happened to you. And I said, well, I don't want to share everything with you. You don't need to hear negative all the time. Yeah. You know, but I wanted you to understand that you can overcome everything. And that's really one of the reasons why I made the film, too, to show people that it doesn't matter where you've been in life, that you can overcome anything. People do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And we need more stories like that out there. Absolutely. As, as you mentioned earlier, you were a high school dropout, and over the course of the documentary, we also see you go back to school at the University of San Diego. You're studying communication. That, to me, is always very inspiring. I also took the road less traveled, I guess you would say, and so it's very inspiring to see you, a mother of three, who have had all of these hardships in life and overcome those and get back on track. I say on track, but get back to you, the mm -hmm. person that you know that you are. I think that's extremely inspiring. And, making those life experiences count in a way that are helping other people but you're also continuing to heal yourself it's a really inspiring story and so with all that being said i know that now that you have a taste of what it means to be a filmmaker and to move and shape and make these things happen and network and relationship in the way that you have um what is next for you well i already started my new film so my script writer is going to be starting that the end of the month and that's another story about a woman who's overcome a lot in her life and so it's someone who came from Korea and immigrated to the United States and it's a true hero's journey I mean it's really incredible like when you really peel back the layers of someone and see where they've been mm -hmm. and how they've gotten to where they are today I mean there's a lot more to everyone than we know I, so yeah that seems to be the theme of, of what we have here today I uh, thank you so much for joining us at iStand we appreciate you. You can see Invisible Scars on iTunes and Amazon, and you can follow Donna at Donna Janice on Twitter and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both, and please do so. She's obviously a woman who makes it